Um, so this is, this is what I was talking about. Here's my little timeline um, of going from software engineer to PhD student to PhD plus full-time. Um, so um, traveling back in time um, to 2017, 18. This was the second year of my PhD. Um, and um, something I wanna bring up is um, the financial struggles that a PhD student goes through. So this is literally um, a graph from my Mint account at the time that I was using to track my personal finances. And um, I was having these ups and downs every month. Um, for some months I was coming out with a little bit of savings, other months I was coming out um, behind. And I felt like overall, I was just barely making ends meet um, on the PhD student income. And, um, you know, I had a trip to see my family in January and it was like, I, I felt like if I bought plane tickets or made any big purchases, um, I would just never recover financially. Um, and so I, I just felt like um, this huge struggle financially um, as I was an RA and a TA during my second year. And um, I always thought that it was, it was like a me thing. I always thought, oh, this is some personal shortcoming. Like I need to save harder, I need to do better, right? Um, and um, that year when I finally started talking to students in my lab and, um, you know, other colleagues about um, my financial struggle, I was hearing the same thing from everyone that they were all struggling too, that they were all finding their own solutions, either getting support from their family. Some people were kind of working like little side hustles. Um, and I realized that this is part of something much, much bigger. And um, so something I wanted to pass on is some sort of like lost memory um, that as a fifth year PhD student, I have these memories, I was part of this. Um, but maybe first and second year PhD students, you might not know about this. Um, but that, um, that spring of 2018, um, there was a student worker strike um, because this is a university-wide problem or even maybe a academic institution-wide problem um, of not really making enough money to make ends meet. And um, I remember sitting in this um, student union meeting and um, the provost at the time was named Jerry uh, Baldasti. And he literally said, there is no plan for the university to keep um, wages up with the rising costs of living in Seattle. And he had no vice advice for students on what they should do. Um, and then he retired. <laughs> and I was shocked. Um, I didn't realize that the university literally had no plan to help us. Um, and um, so, you know, these strikes, you know, there was this one day strike um, that took negotiations forward a little bit. Um, and, um, and then there was a two week strike planned and the university actually threatened to withhold pay. Um, so we got this threatening email um, that asked us to sign in and complete this, you know, sign this thing saying we won't go on strike. And you had to do that or you wouldn't get paid. And, um, and ultimately that was enough to scare students away from doing the strike. Uh, the union voted to cancel the strike. Um, negotiations stopped and we ended up with a 2% wage increase for the next three years. Um, so that's why wages are where they are now for student workers, uh, for TAs and RAs. And um, that was three years ago. <laughs> so, um, so this is the year, this is what's coming um, this spring is going to be the renegotiation of this contract um, for another three years. Um, so, you know, just to provide some of the bigger context here, there's actually um, an institutional issue where students aren't getting paid enough. So if you feel like you're not making enough money to make ends meet, if you feel like you're really struggling, it's not just you, it's everyone at this university and it's students across the country as well. So, um, so that following um, summer, I interned at Google and um, it was a really good experience for me. And I think um, what I really ultimately found out by going to Google and doing that summer internship there is that people cared about my research there. And I was kind of shocked because I was in this, um, I was in this field that I was calling online informal learning at the time, right? I was studying online communities. And what I found is that this really connected with um, what Google was trying to do with Google Cloud, Cloud Platform, right? Which is um, 
it's a it's a product for software engineers to be able to set up um, a bunch of different services where they run computing remotely, right? And um, there, there's awesome resources at Google. So the, the number one resource I would want to share um, that came that was really important for me out of this internship was every single Google researcher's name and email address, <laughs> right? As in, I had access to everyone there and I could literally talk to any of them. I could put a meeting on their calendar and I did. I made so many connections. Um, I remember I would go to these meetings and then I would get on LinkedIn and go through the meeting um, list and literally just connect every single person on LinkedIn. <laughs> like I was in a meeting with you. <laughs> Can we be connected on LinkedIn now? <laughs> um, I found that other people had overlapping interests with my research. I found stakeholders who cared about my research, um, collaborators and mentors. Um, they had really good infrastructure. So I was able to work with um, like some, some people at Google who could go recruit participants for me um, and really expedite the research process. Um, and there was even opportunity to publish. And this was not even on a sort of like research center team. This was a product team. Um, and I still found that there was actually a path to be able to publish. Um, so, um, so what I found is that it was this really resource rich environment. Um, and I also talked to a bunch of Googlers there um, who are researchers, right? Um, so I did, you know, I, I emailed, I put meetings on calendars, I talked to people just to asking for advice. And I would ask them, do you need a PhD to be a researcher at Google? And um, what I found out is that you don't, um, you don't need a PhD to be a researcher at Google. And um, the advice that I got was do, do the PhD if you want to do the PhD. Um, but if you don't, you, you actually don't need it. And so this caused kind of a personal crisis for me where I was like, oh, I don't, I don't need a PhD for the reasons I thought. <laughs> um, so I had to come up with new reasons for staying in the PhD program. And I had to really consider why I wanted to be here. So um, it was no longer just to you know, hold that certificate and be like, now people have to respect me, I have a PhD. People already were treating me with, with respect there. Um, I found out I could get into a career in UX research, which was my dream at the time. Um, without a PhD. So I didn't need a PhD for that either. Um, and um, my advisor was telling me like, you, you, you know, kind of like, this is the only way. And I realized, well, actually, this isn't the only way I can, there's actually a path forward, um, where I could be perfectly happy that doesn't involve having a PhD. Um, but I stayed here because I love, I love the fan fiction research that I'm doing. Um, I feel like it is helping me um, shape myself into a scholar. And because I want to mentor other students here. Um, and those were my reasons for staying in the program. And, um, you know, I, I had been told like, you know, building up your academic CV is important. Getting citations is important. Publishing is, in Kai is important. And I realized that those things aren't actually important to me. And so I was, it, it, I had this really big shift in perspective after doing this internship where I realized my reasons for staying in the program and what I wanted to do. So, um, you know, let's, you know, where are you going, right? So if you're, you may be going into academia and already know that, you may know you want to become a professor, um, or you may know that you want to go into industry at the end of the PhD program, or you might be undecided like I was um, at the beginning of summer 2018. Um, an internship can help you in either any of those situations um, because you'll make connections. Um, you'll learn about how industries and companies work. Um, it'll help open up future opportunities for you um, like a path to full-time conversion um, or opportunities to collaborate with industry researchers in the future. So even if you're a professor, those things are going to be valuable. You're going to want those opportunities to collaborate. You're going to want those connections. Um, and then you'll make a lot of money in your internship. Um, in my case, I made more money than the rest of the year combined. Um, so more, more money in one summer at Google than fall, winter, and spring being a TA or RA at UW. And that really helps um, with, um, with staying financially stable. Um, and then another thing I wanted to point out is it doesn't have to be a research internship. Um, internships in other fields are also valuable. So, um, so if you feel like you can't score that internship at Microsoft Research, that doesn't mean don't do an internship at all. Um, an internship at design could be valuable. An internship um, in engineering or data science um, is valuable. Um, or one in product management. Um, all of those things can apply skills that you've learned in HCDE. 
Um, all of those things can help you build connections to get the benefits that I've outlined above. Um, so what happened to me after um, I finished the summer internship and decided I wanted to get a full-time job? Um, my advisor dumped me um, because he, he didn't want to work with someone who wanted to take on this path. Um, and so I ended up having to find a new advisor. Um, I got a TA ship um, that offer that didn't really match with what I was trying to do. I was trying to get to generals faster. And I was offered this TA ship where it was about co-developing a new course. And um, it was too much work for me at the time. And so I, I turned it down. Um, and I was able to do that because of the money that I had saved over the summer. Um, so I, it actually gave me this leeway to be unemployed, um, to spend all of that time studying for generals. And I actually passed generals in a very, very short period of time. Um, so I only studied for six weeks um, before I completed generals. Um, and then after that, I went on the job market. Um, and um, at the end of my Google internship, I had asked for a return internship offer and gotten it. And, um, it, and then after that, I decided I wanted to go full time. So I went back to them and I said, hey, can I, can I switch? <laughs> uh, and they said, no. Um, and they said, apply through the general application process. And the only jobs open at the time required two years of experience. And I didn't have that. Um, and so ultimately, I actually didn't even get the interview for the job that I wanted at Google. Um, and I ended up having to apply to a bunch of jobs. Um, I applied to, I don't know, something like 50 to 100 data science jobs, and I didn't get any interviews at all. Um, so that's when I started looking for UX research jobs. Um, and um, I was applying to full-time jobs. I didn't get any of those. Um, and ultimately, I um, got a contract job. And so, um, so I want to just outline the difference between a contract job and a full-time employment at a company like Microsoft. Um, so they have this class of employees they call vendors. Um, and those are people who work for sort of a shell company um, that does the recruitment and the hiring and the paying and all of the HR. Um, but you go into Microsoft and you work with Microsoft people every day. Um, so that's what a contract job is. And um, in exchange for taking on a lot of risk uh, for Microsoft, they take a cut of your pay um, is essentially how it works. Um, and so I felt like, hey, this shell company is taking a cut of my pay. I need to keep applying for jobs um, until I get um, to an actual full-time position. So I was working this job and applying for jobs at the same time still. Um, I landed my dream job at Adobe, um, working on the Photoshop team. Um, and I worked there for a year and I got my dream job title. <laughs> so I said, hey, um, I love it here. I want to change my role a little bit towards data science. And um, my boss and boss's boss and boss's boss's boss all were like, yeah, that's great. Um, and that happened in November. So that's the story of how I, <laughs> that's what went down over the last two years. Um, and in the meantime, I did a bunch of really awesome uh, research at UW um, with a group that I call Fan Fiction Data Science. So some internship search advice. Um, is um, you have to make it a priority. So you have to do these things now. You have to get your resume ready now. Um, we're actually in the thick of internship season. So um, postings are live for Google and Facebook and other major companies. Um, and the time to act on it is, is right now. You need to be applying right now. Um, and so that means that if you have an assignment next week um, or tomorrow, um, you might not get that done if you if you end up having to spend a lot of time on your job search and you actually have to prioritize this job search if you want to get a job. Um, and so you, you have to communicate with your professor and say, hey, you know, I need extra leeway here. I need I need to do this. This is really important for my long term career, my financial stability, et cetera. Um, and so um, it does have to be a priority if you want to have a successful job search. Um, you need to ask for help. Um, so your advisor, your family, your friends, your classmates all can um, provide you with a lot of help in the internship search. Um, advisors can, you know, they have connections in industry and they can put your resume and name in and let research, industry researchers know, hey, my, my student is looking for a job. Um, and that can be one route to get to an interview. Um, but you should also be cold applying to companies as well. Uh, you can ask your family to proofread your resume. You can ask your friends and classmates for help. Um, you can do mock interviews. So um, that's definitely something you want to be doing is making this a connected process, not just one you're doing in total isolation. Um, you need to apply to a lot of companies um, because ultimately um, it's kind of a numbers game. 
Um, so on, on the right, um, you can basically see that out of a thousand resumes, a recruiter is going to look at 25 of them, right? So, um, so the odds aren't great for getting past that first step. Um, and most applies that you do at companies will result in nothing. So you have to apply to several different companies in order to increase your odds of getting a reply from any of them. Um, and then you also have to do a little bit of um, SEO on your resume. You need to put the right keywords on there because um, recruiters are actually doing keyword searches, right? So, um, so they're actually putting in particular words, right? And any resumes that have those words in them will turn up. Um, so it's literally about having the right words on your resume. Um, let's talk about having the right words. Um, so, um, so you, I guess um, really quick, what I would say is read the job description and use the same words that they're using in the job description. Um, and then look at your resume as sort of a usability problem where you're trying to help a recruiter make the determination that you're a fit in seven seconds. So they need to look at this one page document and make this decision seven seconds later. That's the average time that they'll spend on a single resume. Um, and here's the questions that they're trying to answer is how much prior experience do you have um, doing the same exact thing? Um, do you have the methods or skills required by this job? Um, do you meet the basic requirements? In other words, is there something that excludes you? Like, um, like you're, you know, you're, you're not in the right fields completely, or you know, it requires a master's degree and you don't have a master's degree. Um, they're just looking you know, to see if there's anything that eliminates you quickly. Um, so you need to make sure that when the basic requirements are outlined in the job description, that it's easy to find those things in your resume. Um, and then is there anything that makes you stand out? And will you add diversity? Um, so if you have these five things covered, a recruiter can make that decision really quickly. Um, and you need to make sure that this information is, um, is at the top in the headings, in the beginnings of sentences, right? Um, and and that's, that's how a recruiter is going to be able to put your job in the right pile and ultimately reach out to you. Um, so we've got some amazing folks in this call. Um, so some suggested questions, um, ask them about internships at their company, um, ask them about the interview process, um, ask them about the full-time conversion process. Um, and then ask them about their own experiences um, in industry, what they thought when they were in school and what it looks like now. Um, and ask them about um, how you can translate the research that you're doing now into, um, into bullet points on a, on a profile that a rec recruiter can use to make a determination about um, whether to give you a call. Um, so thanks so much for being here. Um, I, I really appreciate everyone and um, looking forward to some interesting conversation. Thanks so much, Jenna. Oh, that's such great content. I'm glad we'll be able to share this out with everyone afterwards as they're getting through that process. Um, before we open it up to questions, let's just jump over. We could start with Brooke. And if you'd like to introduce kind of your journey from PhD to industry and, and that connection of academic academic to, to industry and what that looked like for you? Yep, thanks Kathleen. Um, so I'm Brooke Sattler. I am currently a user experience researcher at Facebook. Um, so a little over six years ago, I was getting towards the end of my PhD program. Um, and for a long time throughout my PhD program, I wanted to be a professor. I loved academic research. I loved teaching um, and it really just aligned with who, who I was. Um, but, you know, early in my PhD program, I got married and my husband is a designer and I knew we needed to stay in a big city. So kind of some personal things aligning with, you know, professional. Um, and then towards the end of my academic career, I was also getting a little burnt out of the long academic life cycle of research, um, where research can take years and years. Um, and then sometimes you don't ever see the impact of your research or it can take really long time to see the impact. So a few things that were kind of spinning in my head um, as things were happening. And the last thing I'd add, because Jenna highlighted it, um, was the thought about you know, making a little bit more money during my PhD program, also kind of noticing the bank account as well. So a, few, a lot of different things kind of swirling in my head. Um, and so then I, 
um, had a baby, graduated with my PhD. I worked um, at the Center for Engineering, Learning and Teaching with Dr. Jennifer Turns and Dr. Cindy Atman. I'd worked with them for a long time through my undergrad and my master's and PhD, um, but I still conducted some research with them um, after my PhD. Really great transition um, professionally and personally um, as having a baby and lots of different things happening. Um, but I decided that it was really kind of an opportunity for me to go into industry. I was interested in how do you connect research to business? What does that look like? I knew that that was a really big gap in my understanding. Um, and I was also really interested in what does it look like for research to move fast? What does it look like to conduct uh, research in a couple of days or a week or two versus months or years? Um, and so I transitioned to industry about six years ago and went to Expedia leading research for hotels, um, consumer facing shopping. Um, and it was it was my biggest swerve professionally. Um, I definitely experienced imposter syndrome where I struggled with, can I conduct this types of, type of research? Can I move fast enough? Really doubting myself, even though I had conducted research for the previous 10, 10 years or so, um, but really doubting myself. So it really took that first few studies, getting in, getting my feet under me, learning what it was like to um, engage with cross-functional stakeholders, product management, design, engineering, product marketing management, what, what was each of their needs? How do I engage with them? And how do I build you know, a relationship with them all in service of impacting either the product specifically or the strategy for the product or how our teams organize? Um, so a little bit long-winded, but that's kind of my journey from academia into industry. Kathleen, I'll, I'll pass it back to you. Thanks so much. Steve, are you still there? You wanna share your journey? Sure. So uh, uh, like a lot of other people on the call, I started the program really believing that I was going to be uh, a faculty member. Uh, I'd, uh, I'd actually been a math teacher in K-12 prior to that. Uh, and it was really uh, uh, something I thought was going to be my final destination uh, for all sorts of reasons, not the least of which is I sort of looked at where faculty openings happened. And, and boy, there just was almost literally no job market any place I wanted to live. Uh, and so I looked at that and said, well, the quality of life is really important to me. I don't want to end up spending the next 25 years of my life in, you know, rural Iowa. Uh, so forget that. Uh, and so I got an internship uh, and mine was at, uh, was at IBM. Uh, as Jenna mentioned, uh, I made uh, uh, better money there than during my, uh, my research assistantship. Uh, but it also helped me understand uh how much more rewarding in from my perspective things can be in terms of using the using sort of the discipline of thought you're going to get out of the program uh to attack problems and solve them and and then see them come to fruition uh as brooke mentioned and so i went from from that i i got a company at, i got a job at a company called lexus nexus where we did a lot of work on identity fraud and uh compliance uh and i've just sort of worked my way up from there i targeted product management, left UX, mostly because at the end of the day, I really wanted to be, frankly, in charge of what we were making. I wanted to own the strategy. I wanted to own the product. I wanted to take responsibility for the profit and loss uh, because that means so long as I could empirically justify it, uh, I got to drive the bus, which was important to me because I consistently was part of teams that I knew they didn't have a good strategy. I knew that the way that they were organized and led was poor, uh, and I just, uh, I just knew I could do better. So for those of you who kind of like to drive the bus, for those of you who think, you know what, I can articulate a strategy, I can motivate talent, uh, then within the HCDE realm, product management is really the place to go where you will find some professional happiness, in my opinion. That's been my experience anyway. So that led me to where I am now, uh, and, um, you know, uh, it, uh, it's been, it's been a good journey all in all. So, uh, that's where I'm coming from and, and I'm looking forward to any, any questions that folks have. Thanks so much. I love that line professional happiness, which is so crucial to, you know, our own personal happiness too. Yeah. Um, I, I want to open it up in case anybody has any questions from our current students, feel free to drop those in the chat or hop on the mic. Um, we'll keep it pretty open and casual that way. Otherwise, I'll just kick off 
with one of our questions that we have. Um, and maybe Steve, since you just were speaking, we'll, we'll kick it to you. Um, when you're looking at PhD now as an employee, an employer, you know, when you see PhD applicants coming in, whether it's internships or full-time roles, what are, what are some things that help them stand out and make that transition from academia to industry? Well, so right now we're actually uh, uh, looking at, we just finished a, a round of, of hiring for more senior folks. And those with advanced degrees were those that got the look. It's just that simple. I mean, it is a field that has matured to the point where you really need to have demonstrated uh, a knowledge set above and beyond what you're going to get as an undergraduate. It's just, it's table stakes if you're looking for uh, a more senior position, at least uh, from the way that we look at it. The other thing that's really going to separate you from uh, others who are looking uh, is the ability to tell a story that ends. And this is, I mean, academia, this is not part of the culture, but I assure you in industry, it is a story that ends in revenue or market share growth. That's, that's the purpose of the businesses, right? I mean, they, they exist to make money so that everybody gets raises and gets all that good money we've been talking about. And so to be able to connect your skills in identifying, diagnosing, breaking apart, solving problems, to be able to say, I use these methodologies out of UX to help understand users and that helped us build a solution that they, you know, that they cared about enough to buy. And if you can't tell that last part of the story, that's still okay if in your portfolio or in your, in your interviews, you're able to articulate how that's gonna work uh, in industry how you would be able to use this, that, or the other approach in order to understand users, which is important uh, in defining the solution that people are gonna buy. So again, really focusing on the end of that story because everybody's gonna be able to tell a story about how, you know, if you've got this kind of a problem, you're gonna use this methodology and that's gonna get you these kinds of results. But that's only two thirds of the story. It's the last third that's really the, the, the meat of it all. So, so be able to articulate why it is valuable in a commercial sense, because it is, you just have to be able to, to tell the end of that story. That's really what I would emphasize more than anything else. That and stories that you have about how you are a good team member, particularly if you are on a team where maybe not everybody was a good team member, uh, and to, to, to help describe how you helped keep the team together, how you helped it uh, go forward. Those are real life situations that you're going to get into um, that, that you need to be able to articulate, but particular to a PhD student and a PhD graduate saying the rest of the story, saying how these advanced skills can turn into growth and money. That is a hugely powerful story uh, once you can articulate it. Thank you. Yeah, I save all my failure stories for interviews and, and like what came out of that and what I did and, and that always seems to help out. Jenna, do you want to say something? Yeah, so um, something that I, I see as kind of like a mistake that people make when they're applying to their first jobs or writing their first resume is that they have these really good experiences, but they're not writing it up in a way that people in industry are going to understand and be able to relate to. Um, they're not using the right words or they're using academia words where they could just use simple English, right? Um, and, or they're not using the right verbs. Um, so they're, you know, they're, they're saying, or even that they're understating um, what they did um, and not really stating the full impact of what they did. Um, so, you know, I think an example of this is, um, you know, someone will say like, I ran an interview study, right? But really what you did is a whole bunch of steps, right? You, you defined a set of criteria for who's going to participate. You reached out, you recruited, right? You, you interviewed people, <laughs> right? And then, um, you know, you'll say like, we wrote a thematic analysis, right? Um, but you won't say something, something like we identified um, specific problems, right? And actually translated that into solutions, right? And so I feel like people will kind of, you know, glaze over some of the important details of what they did 
Um, and some of those important details contain information that um, say that you're going to be able to do this job, even if it's not the exact same thing that this job is. Um, and so I think it's so important to um, look at the job description and look at what the, what the people are asking for. And sometimes those job descriptions are really wordy and there's only a few sentences in that job description that really matter, that really say what the requirements are, what you're going to do. So it's identifying those things in the job description that aren't just fluff, that actually matter. Um, and then actually translating your experiences to match those things that matter the most. Um, and making sure not to glaze over the details in your experience that actually matter the most. Um, so that's, that's what I would say um, is sometimes the issue is just translating it to the right words um, or talking about the, the parts of the experience that really matter for the, the job position. Brooke, do you wanna add anything or have any stories to share? Um, I just add one thing in highlighting what Jenna said of giving ourselves enough credit for the experiences that we have. I think that oftentimes if we're making a pretty big pivot or swerve in our professional career, we might think, oh, those experiences don't count or it wasn't, you know, research in that way. Um, and I recognize now as I look back, I wasn't giving myself enough credit, right? You know, I went, might have put my title because UW gave me titles of like program manager or research scientist or things like that, but I wouldn't describe in detail like Jenna's saying. Um, and it was all about figuring out how to tell my story. Um, and so I'd really work on, you know, what is that story of what you bring to industry um, and figuring out the right way to, to sell yourself. I'll pass it back to you, Kathleen. Yeah, that's great. It's like you have all the tools already. It's just figuring out how to package it and share that. Can I say yeah. one more thing? Yeah. I want to use the word leadership. That's what that's what really came up with for me with what Brooke is saying is like people are understating when they exhibited leadership. And companies, when they, especially when they're recruiting new talent, um, they're looking for future leaders. And so, you know, being able to talk about experiences where you're a leader and not understate what you did and how you showed leadership like that's I think that's that's one of the key little pieces to this great um I think another helpful question to dive into is what does a typical UX research interview look like what are the components what are the materials you should have and what should you be prepared for I'm happy to take this one, Jenna, to start to kick off because um, I've gone through this recently having transition jobs. Um, so I think one of the big things that the community often debates about right off the bat is a portfolio for UX researchers or not. Um, there, there's different perspectives on this. Um, I don't have an online portfolio. I did when I was transitioning from academia to industry. I, If I went back again, I wouldn't do it. Um, and I, I've conducted a lot of interviews and haven't looked at portfolios. To me, it's when they come in and present the, the, um, their presentation that that's really where I get to see if they have the research chops. So um, the portfolio or the research interview process, typically it's like a phone call with a recruiter. Um, that's just a general screening call. They're just trying to make sure that you have kind of the methods down and what has been your experience um, and do you kind of align with the job um, and what the hiring manager is looking for. And then typically it goes on to a phone phone screen that's a little bit deeper. Um, it depends on the company. Each company kind of does it differently. Um, but typically this is more a technical um, interview. And um, at like Facebook, they will give you a ask you to identify a product and ask like a hypothetical research question. Um, and what they're trying to do is see how you would go about conducting this research. So what type of methods would you consider um, thinking about pros and cons of each of the methods? Um, why would you choose one method over the other? Um, and then your participant selection, why? So it all really comes down to what are the decisions you're making? What did you consider and your rationale for choosing that? Um, and then another piece of this is, you know, how do you include your cross-functional stakeholders in the conversation? Um, so bringing, bringing your team along for the research journey um, is really important. And that's something that they look for. Because as a UX researcher, 
we're not just going into a black box and conducting research for a week or two or a month and then throwing insights over to the other side, but we're really helping our team understand the insights so that they can leverage them in the design or in like um, Steve's case in the strategy and figuring out kind of the plan for our team um, or in engineering when they're actually, you know, going and implementing the things. So I think a big part of it too is how are you going to bring along your your cross-functional stakeholders. So it's typically a technical interview, about 45 minutes, and then the on-site right now, the virtual on-site. Um, most companies, it'll be a presentation. Um, you will present one or two of your research examples. Some companies do give you a um, like a scenario where you like have to go through and design a study around it. Um, but oftentimes they're now having you present research that you have conducted. Again, it's all around like, you know, what, how did you define the research question? So again, bringing in those trust and functional stakeholders, does agreeing on the scope of the research and the research questions, the method you chose and why, the participants and why, um, and then executing. And sometimes they'll also have you flip it on their head, on the head and kind of, you know, hey, imagine you had more time and unlimited resources, what would you do differently? Um, so that's that's a little bit about it. And then typically in the um, in that day of the onsite interviews, you'll have one-on-ones with people and they focus on different parts. Some of it's around cross-functional stakeholders and engaging with them. Some of it's about how do you impact the product. So really around, you know, how do you make sure that your insights land so it ha they have impact on the product. Um, so, you know, that's a quick overview of kind of end to end. Um, there's a lot that's been written. There are great medium articles around like the Google, Facebook, Amazon, UX research interviews um, that have some you know, pretty good details of the types of questions that are asked as well. And Jenna, do you want to add more to that? Or Steve? Well, yeah, hey, so I would just that that Brooke mentioned that has been, I think, particularly fruitful for me when I see candidates come through is the ability to sort of trans on approach of academic research. You set up this big study and you run it and you don't want to change anything through the middle of it because the outcome is a new piece of knowledge and that knowledge needs to have fidelity and stand up to peer review and all of that jazz. Industry is, is, is a completely different animal. You, you set something up and then you're going to go back to stakeholders and you're going to tweak it and you're going to tweak it and you're going to tweak it and you're going to iterate the research while it's in motion. And that is absolutely critical. And it's sort of not how you're trained to do research in the academic setting. But if you can demonstrate that, particularly in those uh, in those interactive interviews during the hiring process, that will be uh, great because you'll be able to look at them and go, OK, so here's how I would set it up. And then we do X, Y, and Z. And then I'd have to come back to these two stakeholders and ask them, what do you want to do about this? Because that's going to tell me how I refine the approach and which piece of information I get from users next, which, you know, which analysis I do next. And if you can set up a sort of a decision tree like that, then you really are demonstrating the way it's got to get done in industry. It's all the same skills. It's just about the, the pace and being able to be more flexible and progressive and how you adjust uh, and demonstrating that because that's really one of the main concerns coming uh, out of academia for a lot of candidates is that is that they don't understand the the pace and the number of adjustments that need to get made. And if you can show that, whether it be in a portfolio or a resume, but especially during your interviews, that's going to be really helpful because that's how things are actually happening. Yeah, I, I want to echo two really important points that you both made. So one question that I got during an interview was, um, how would you design a usability study for a Jetpack? It's coming out in nine months, right? And I think that's a good like representative question because it doesn't really matter what the product is, right? What, you know, when they're, when they're asking that question, you can still talk about two really important things. And one thing is, uh, and Brooke said this, is stakeholders, right? Part of, the, part of your answer, if, if you're going to give an answer, it has to mention stakeholders and how you're going to bring them in and get them involved. And then um, from what Steve said, um, iteration, right? Um, rapid iteration, like how are you going to change things as it's ongoing, right? What are your multiple stages? If you don't talk about iteration and you don't talk about stakeholders, it's not going to be a good <laughs> answer to the question. 
<laughs> you have to involve those elements for sure. I think those are both really important. Um, we do I have a question in the chat. Was that what you were looking at, Jenna? Yeah. <laughs> Um, when looking for internships, how does work experiences before graduate school play a role, if any? Do you have any suggestions for someone having work experience in markets outside of the US? And this is from one of our students who is currently outside of the US. So I, I love this question. Um, so um, I was a computer, you know, I, was a, I did a computer science undergrad. I was an, a software engineer. Um, before I went to grad school. And um, talking about having technical expertise and strength and saying, I know how to program, I know what software developers do. Those are one of the stakeholders. And what I see is they don't get, you know, researchers don't involve them enough. Researchers don't talk to them enough. And I experienced that personally, right? And I want to change that, right? It was, was part of um, my story when I went to interviews and talked to people. So I, I did talk directly about that. Um, people also always asked me why I left software engineering. So that was, that was always a thing too. Um, and I would say, I want more um, autonomy and more impact, right? So why did you go to grad school, right? Why did you leave your field and go to grad school? Have a good answer to that um, and, um, and relate it to, um, to what you want to do in the future. Um, and I think I don't have work experience outside of the US, but um, I think if someone does, it's really impressive. Um, and um, certainly at large companies, um, they're always thinking about globalization, right? They're always thinking about how do we translate things to other markets? And so saying, I understand how other markets work. I'm multicultural. I have um, experiences in different countries um, and, and you know, that has shown me how people differ and how needs differ, right? Um, between people of different cultures, right? That's going to be a really interesting point and it's going to make you um, unique and it's going to mean that you bring in a perspective that other people won't have. Um, and so that would be super valuable to talk about during an interview. Yeah, I would, uh, I would double down on the, on the, uh, uh, the non-US part of that. We have, you know, our, our products are used by everybody all over the planet, right? The sun never sets on our products. Uh, and there is undoubtedly still uh, in our company an implicit cultural bias to both uh, sort of your, your garden variety U.S. perspective in that uh, You cut out, Steve. Can you say it again? As both Jen and Brooke have said, you, you really got to be able to say more than I'm from someplace else, you've got to be able to articulate it within the context of the story of, and so it helps me do one, two, and three. Uh, you got you to finish that whole story, but it could be very powerful. Uh -oh, I worry we missed the, kind of the middle part before um... Be able to say more than you're just from outside the US, but more details about your experience, maybe? Yeah, I mean, more, more details, but for me, it's, it's more details that are used to, in order to create new insight, right? So that's sort of the, the ending of the story, right? That's the resolution of it all is because I have a different perspective, it allows me to bring the business these things that otherwise it you probably wouldn't be able to have if you know you just hired a bunch of people to look like Steve. Exactly. It's, it sounds similar to the advice for applicants too. It's like you have to make meaning of your experience and like connecting it to what you're applying to and bring it full circle in that way. Any other questions from the group? I'll, I'll work my way down on our pre-planned questions. Um, any, let's, let's briefly just talk about LinkedIn. Anything, any tips or um, conversations about LinkedIn? We're, we're, we have some videos from the Career Center that students can use to update their account. Um, how, how much is that used and used for the interview process?
I can go first on this one. Um, it's extremely used. Um, some recruiters live their lives on LinkedIn, um, like almost eight hours a day on LinkedIn every day, um, sourcing and going through things on LinkedIn. So um, your LinkedIn profile is often going to be the first thing that a recruiter looks at. Um, when they hear your name, they'll type it into LinkedIn. Um, and my advice would be to um, actually look at other people's LinkedIn, LinkedIn's who are in the job that you want um, and see what they're doing and make yours more like theirs, <laughs> especially if they look really good. Um, and um, so that, you know, um, so that's, that's a bit of a process, but um, the time is certainly going to be worth the in investment. Um, and ultimately it should also align with your resume. So don't, um, so, you know, share the same experiences that are on your resume um, and um, you can use some of the same language. Um, but I would say just take a look at other people's LinkedIn and, um, and for the ones that, um, that you look up to that you think are really solid, because um, you'll definitely start to get a sense of whose LinkedIn is solid and whose isn't. Um, make yours more like the solid ones. <laughs> I would add to that um, being active on LinkedIn also is a, a good thing to do. Um, so this means, you know, engaging with other people's posts, um, but also posting as well. So if you're, you know, conducting research that's been published, like sharing that out on there, um, it elevates your, like who sees you um, and like who would follow you as well. So it just like makes you more present to those recruiters or the hiring managers because you're like part of the conversation. Um, and so I think that's been super helpful for me in the last few years as being a little bit more active. So I like post, like I'm a co-chair for Hexagon UX in the Seattle area. So I post about that. When I worked at Uber, I'd post our Uber work, um, anything that you know, comes from HCD that I'm involved in, I post on that. So kind of being active on there as well um, as what Jenna said about having, you know, a solid profile. Yeah, I think my one piece of advice uh, on LinkedIn is, is yes, you need a, <laughs> yes, you need a sort of an industry standard profile and you definitely want to stay active, particularly during and transition time in your career. Uh, but the other thing I would say is, is don't rely on it. Uh, because I've got lots of LinkedIn connections and I could pass them in a grocery store. I don't know who they are. And that's probably not good sort of LinkedIn hygiene on my part, but I don't think I'm alone. The best connections you have on LinkedIn are people you've met in real life. You talk to them, even if it's just once over coffee, that's fine. But LinkedIn should be a repository of your professional uh, connections. It should not sort of replace them. And I know in the COVID world, it's, it's hard to do that, but your, your LinkedIn network is never going to be as powerful as your actual personal network. And so spend time building that as much as you can, and then connect with that person on LinkedIn when you're done. Don't use it as sort of a virtual crutch because it's nowhere near as powerful as being able to just pick up the phone and call somebody and say, Hey, Franco, uh, two years ago, we worked on this. Uh, I need your help. LinkedIn is not a replacement for that. And so uh, use it appropriately. Do those things that Jen and, and Brooke said, but, but no, you got to put the time in to meet people and get to know them uh, and build your personal network outside uh, of LinkedIn. That's really crucial. I agree with that, um, but I would also add, um, don't be afraid to reach out to people on LinkedIn. Um, so I do get um, every now and then a, a cold reach out from a student um, at UW, either in the iSchool, um, sometimes HCD even, um, who I haven't really met in person before. And um, there's two kinds of reach, reach outs I'll get. One is, um, hey, can, you know, you know, I'm, you know, I'm really interested in, you know, data science, or I'm really interested in Adobe. Um, and I'd love to just, you know, connect with you and meet you and ask you for some advice, right? And those are the ones that I'll respond to. Um, and then the other kind that I get are, hey, I'm applying for this job at Adobe, can you refer me to it? <laughs> and those are the ones that I ignore. Um, so, um, but what I appreciate is that those, those people actually had the guts to reach out. Um, and it, and it, it 
I'm I'm much I'm much nicer than maybe you might expect. Like I'm not I'm not going to be cruel to anyone who reaches out to me. And I think um, people get a lot of social anxiety when it comes to reaching out to people cold on the internet. Um, and I and I promise, like people are people are fairly nice most of the time. Um, and if you reach out to a few people, there's a chance you could make a connection or two, and it could be really valuable. Okay. Uh, can, I, can I ask a quick question? Go ahead, Kelvin. I know Brooke might have to sign off. It's 10. Um, so thank you so much, Brooke. If you need to leave, that's definitely okay. And we appreciate you being here. And Steve, I don't know if you have any wiggle room, um, but I think Jenna does. Um, yeah, I can give you another five or 10 minutes. That's all right. Calvin, we'll let you close out. Sure. I mean, I, given we don't have a ton of time left, I think what I struggled with the most is the translation piece, right? Kind of translating my research experience into um, what this might mean for industry. And so, uh, yeah, given the time constraints right now, do you have any resources or tools you can point me to that would like help me kind of develop that translational skill? Or Jenna, we can just have virtual coffee sometime, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, Steve, do you have any thoughts on this one? Because I've got more time. Yeah, so I, I think my I, I think I'd have to ask a uh, I invoke the annoying research question and say what exactly is it that you're you're trying to a good answer to what you're thinking about? Uh, sorry, you cut out kind of halfway through. So, um, what was your question? Connection uh, up here, but. I, so the uh, uh, what I would say is I think I need to know more about what was what, what specifically you were having trouble with. Generally speaking, I would I think I'd go back to a lot of what was said and just say you know be able to take. Here's one sort of concrete piece of advice in telling your story is because you know how research actually. To change direction, you don't have to learn and. Oh, you're cutting All out. of the arrows. Oh, you already have the arrows in your quiver. You just need to be able to to uh, tell a story that says, "Look, when we need to iterate, I don't need to learn a new methodology, right? I just uh, I can pivot right now." Uh, uh, quiver of arrows. They're going to have only what they got learning on the job. You've got the full set emphasize that as a way to to translate your skills into industry which is that i can pivot and iterate quickly because i already know all the different ways that we need to do things that's that do, do not underestimate how important that can be because in academia that's taken for granted but in industry that's a that's a big differentiator yeah i think um i think learn it sounds like there's kind of like unwritten rules or kind of like an invisible like way of talking about the things my experiences that um i need to learn more about but um yeah jenna i don't know we could we could also connect after this meeting well i can stay on um i just want to say thanks steve yeah thank you thank you um, steve, so much um if you have to sign off that's okay um i also just want to say too cal that it sounds like potentially we need interview practice, which we could do mock interviews and stuff at a later time too. Uh, yeah, I mean, I didn't know that's something um, HCD did, uh, but I, yeah, I, um, I like bombed a Facebook interview back in December. And I think a lot of it just came from like, not knowing how to talk about my research experience in a way that was useful to hear for the interviewers. Um, and Jenna, something that you were saying during, during this call is like, uh, you know, there's even within just like a thematic analysis, right? There's so many things hidden under their surface that like could be highlighted that we often like just kind of like hand wave past. Um, and so I think I'll have to think more deeply about like what 
I mean, what it really means to like lead a project on my own and like kind of be there for every step of the process. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Um, so first of all, let me really quick, part one is like, do it on your resume, right? So, um, you know, the recruiter is trying to make sure that you know all of the different methods and skills that are in the job description. So, um, so for something like Facebook, right? Here's a Facebook JD. Um, and it says using approaches such as focus groups, in-depth interviews, quantitative surveys, and statistical modeling, right? So the words focus groups, the words inter interview, um, you know, survey, and statistical modeling, right? All of those should be on your resume, right? So part one is just making sure that the, the resume is a match to the job description, right? Um, because you've, you've done all of those things, at least in coursework, right? Um, so every HCE student knows those four things. So um, we shouldn't be getting eliminated just because of the wording on the resume or, or which things we chose to tell about and which ones we didn't, right? Um, now for the interview, um, there's, so there's, you know, one question is, you know, tell me how you would design a study for X, right? And that you would just walk, you walk through the process, you talk about how you would collaborate with stakeholders, you talk about how you might iterate, um, you talk about um, a method you would use and why, right? So how you justify which method you would use, right, et cetera, et cetera. And the other is to talk about an experience that you've already had. And I think that's the really important interview questions um, is not like, how would you do something? It's how have you done it? Um, because, um, you know, past, past performance is the best predictor of future behavior, right? Um, and so it's, I think the real important part is, is um, thinking about how you would tell the story of when you ran a research project. Um, and it starts with, you know, how did you identify a problem, right? Um, who did you involve? Like, you know, what stakeholders did you bring in? Um, and I, I think it can be really tough because um, in academia and in industry, people are kind of speaking a different language, right? They're talking about the same sort of things, right? But maybe they're using different words, right? And even in my um, in my daily life, right? I go to academia, I use the words participatory design. I go to Adobe and I use the word co-design. Um, and it means basically the same thing, right? Um, which, which is to uh, be, you know, be, it's to facilitate a workshop and distribute power to um, the people who are actually going to use the thing, the participants, right? Um, but I, I choose different words um, because they seem to work better. <laughs> um, and um, so part of it could be the, the words that you're using. Um, part of it could be which parts of the story are you telling? Um, and are you telling in a way, in a way that um, will make sense for industry people when they're trying because they're, they're trying to think about how can this person um, help me essentially justify the growth, you know, more headcount for my team, you know, help me go to my bosses and get more headcount for my team and expand my team. How can it help me um, raise numbers that are used to evaluate the effectiveness of our team, right? And so, um, so that's, that's kind of what Steve was saying about how it impacts the bottom line, right? How, how it results in profit. And we're not doing academic research for profit, right? Um, so it can be hard to translate those experiences to, you know, like <laughs> words that people use to talk about making money, right? Um, and, um, but there are some shared words like impact, right? Um, we can talk about this is the impact that it had. Um, there are words like growth, right? Um, where it can, where you can say, um, you know, after we did this thing, this community grew, right? Or the amount of the amount of people were participating grew, right? Um, and so, I think uh, what Steve said about like kind of getting to the result and making sure that you're able to articulate um, not just sort of like the the findings or the themes, right? But um, but the impact, um, the effect on numbers, on behavior. Um, you know, on things that are going to get as close as possible to, um, to what um, ultimately hiring managers are going to be worried about. Um, and, you know, what they're worried about is growing their team, um, having a successful product, um, having a, an efficient collaboration, 
um, you know, like good, good teamwork, good positive energy in their team. Right. Um, so, you know, if you, if you talk about experiences where things get went badly and you help to resolve those, those issues, right. You talk to people, um, you heard people out, you showed empathy, right. Um, those all, those all sort of relate to things that can be important and in an industry type of scenario. So maybe, maybe it'd help if you talk about a study that you did. Yeah. I, yeah. So I did, I did the whole, like, gave a presentation on my research and um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I, I had a lot of takeaways from that. Like don't do an interview or like the interview was like the first time I had spoken all day. Cause like I was living alone and so hadn't talked to people in a while. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that is really important, I guess. Um, and then like, yeah, a bunch of other things, but <clears throat> um, I think, like you said, like having feeling like there's two different languages that definitely uh, resonated with me. Um, and so I'm just like, how do I speak their language? Because I, I don't know, like, I truly like, feel like I have, like, I could be a very six, like, I could do this job very well. Yeah. Um, and I just like have to or, like convince them of that. Um, and so that's tough. But uh, yeah, this has been helpful, though. So, you know, let's, let's say you ran an interview, right? Um, just get a friend to be your sort of straw interviewer and just say, <laughs> tell me about a time when you ran an interview, right? Yeah. And, and practice kind of what's your, what's your first elevator spiel? What's your two minute spiel of that project, yeah. right? And that story from beginning to end. And just get that out to sort of a, a mock interviewer. And it doesn't even need to be like someone from industry who knows how to ask really good follow up questions. It could just be a you know, friend or family member who can just ask the first question and you can just practice that, that first part. Um, and, and just getting it so it's really fluid, articulate, demonstrates that you have passion for what you're doing. Um, I can't understate how important like vibe and passion is. Um, and some some interviews don't go well because you didn't vibe with that that interviewer, um, and maybe that's a good thing. Maybe you didn't want to work with that person in the end. Yeah. Maybe you would have been miserable there, right? And and sometimes it's okay. <laughs> like there's yeah, two yeah. people in the interview, and when an interview goes badly, um, there's two parties involved in that, and it's not just always your fault either. Um, it can be it can be a bad interviewer too. Um, yeah. it, can be, and, it can be someone who kind of gives you stone coldness and doesn't ask a good follow-up questions or awkwardly sits there silently or doesn't nod or doesn't make eye contact, right? Or is literally doing something else on their computer screen, right? Yeah. And if they're a crappy interviewer, the interview, you're not going to do well either, right? Um, so that can happen too. Yeah. And virtually it's hard to connect with people, I find like, you know, I think a lot of my charm comes from in person and so... Uh, yeah, it was definitely tough. Um, yeah, but I think Jenna, uh, I might follow up with you to talk more about this because I'm like desperate for an internship this summer because I um, am tired of being rent insecure. So I'd love to have some money for that. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel that I've been there. Um, and it's, you know, what I would say to you right now is it's a numbers game. Um, so one thing you can't do is like apply to 20 jobs at just to Amazon, <laughs> even though they have so many postings, just apply to one or two, um, 20 won't work, but, um, you can apply it to many, many different companies. Uh, and that's the way to play the numbers game is to do lots of different companies, um, and apply, 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 apply. Um, and, um, cause part of this is kind of like probability and dice roll a little bit, um, that you'll meet the right person and make the right connection. Um, that being said, what you said about virtual calls, um, I found, so in the job that I have now, um, and that first virtual call with the person who's my boss now, um, there actually was a spark. Um, and I remember it was because she told me um, she finished her PhD while working at Adobe on that team. <laughs> you can Perfect. say that to me in the same room. You can say that to me over a video call. You can say this to me anywhere, and that's going to light me up um, because 
that was the first person I heard say that. And that was like, suddenly I was like, is that a little twinkling light at the end of my tunnel? <laughs> right? Like, holy crap, someone else did this, right? Um, and so sometimes it's just like, like I said, sometimes it's, it's about being the right person. Um, and um, yeah, I agree, video, video calls can be hard to connect, but, um, but sometimes, you know, but for me, it was, it was, there was a spark there that I hadn't had talking to other people over a video call. That just, it was kind of like a little bit of, of magic that happened there. Um, and if I hadn't applied to a zillion jobs, I would, <laughs> the magic would never have come. <laughs> I applied to a lot of jobs um, to get to that point, so. Okay. Um, happy to follow up if you wanna, if you wanna chat sometime, um, just shoot me an email. Um, I, I think you have my email address, right? Do you still use your UDAP one? Yeah, it forwards to my Gmail. Cool. Okay. Hey Jenna, do you do you use the star method at all? Do you know about that? Um, what's the star method? <laughs> it's um situation, task, action, and result. It's kind of a formula oh, okay. for how to respond questions. I mean, you probably use it in different forms. Um, but I think that can be so helpful too, Calvin is thinking about every response that you have follows the same example bearing type piece. And, and like Steve said, with having a result, like a measurable component at the end, that's part of the result part of STAR. Um, I can just send you a little PDF about it too, that I think could be really helpful. But um, this was great. Thank you yeah, so much you. for Thank coming. You. All right, bye. Bye. Bye.